Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. Today I'm live with Peter Brummel, whose YouTube account is uh, called Paleologos, and he's here today to discuss hominin fossils. So welcome, Peter. Hello there, Gideon. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's great to talk with you, and I've been enjoying your content since I, I discovered your channel. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I wonder if maybe you could start off by just introducing yourself. You know, who are you? What's your background? And so on. Yeah, so my interest is kind of in paleoanthropology, um, I, which is the study of fossilized humans and then also some creatures which conventional science would say are ancestral to them. And so that is kind of my area of research. Um, I'm a Protestant, um, and so that's kind of where I'm coming from on this. Mm -hmm. And so basically... Yeah, I've been working for several years now with Dr. Todd Wood, who you mentioned uh, you kind of knew. Um, mm -hmm. And together we've been working on barominology, which is basically the study of the created kinds and how you're trying to figure out like what creatures from the fossil record are human and what are not. So that is kind of my area of interest and what research I am involved in. And yeah, as you mentioned, I have this channel called Paleologos, which I talk about hominin fossils and young earth creationism and bad creationist arguments and bad evolutionary arguments, kind of all of that together there. Yeah. Yeah. I like that you are willing to critique bad creationisms. You know, this is something that I think we're accused of, of not being reflective and just going to whatever argument sort of comes up of, oh, this is an argument for creationism. So we're just going to put it forward regardless of if it's good or being reflective. But no, I actually think there's quite a bit of introspection within, especially the good elements of the creationist community, and that we're willing to be self-critical, critical of other theories and try and subject our ideas to peer review. And one of the problems is that since some of our work is based off of the Bible, lots of people like to equate the creation models, the ideas that we come up with the Bible itself. So like I've done things before about like the canopy model, and I just got a huge amount of pushback from people telling me I'm not a creationist. Um, you know, I, I'm not even a Christian if you don't believe in the canopy model theory. And, you know, that's where it's important to, like, show people, you know, the distinction between the models that we make to try to explain the scripture and then, you know, the actual basics that the scripture says yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you saw it, but I recently had a debate with Jimmy Aiken about creationism. And something in my opening statement I tried to distinguish is how... We're, how the Bible can guide science, but where science is also independent. And my analogy I gave, uh, I think in the debate, I had given an analogy of how um, archaeology from first century Judea could influence our reading of the Gospels. But I think actually going back, I think with my initial draft, what I would actually wanted to talk about was Egyptian chronology, how there seems to be quite a bit of debate on which pharaoh was... Um, the Pharaoh of the Exodus. You know, some people are very convinced it's Ramses II. Other people think it goes back a lot further. I tend to be a 13th dynasty Exodus person, but I'm not going to go out and call someone not a Christian because they think the Exodus actually happened in the 19th dynasty, you know? <laughs> and so I think that it's important that we distinguish, as you were saying, our scientific theories, which might be influenced by the Bible from the actual text of the Bible itself, which is what our faith is in. Right. And I think especially when we get into kind of the ideas surrounding humans and what humans are like, uh, a lot of our base, our, a lot of our thinking is based off of the Bible. But then we also have kind of some tradition to deal with kind of as well when we're thinking about, you know, things like like that. Um, mm -hmm. For example, a lot a lot of young earth creationists think that Adam and Eve looked exactly like us. You probably uh, so we were having a little discussion about that this afternoon. That was a yeah. bit of a heated premiere um, on my channel. Um, but yeah, so that that's one for example of, you know, a, a preconception that a lot of young earth creationists are placing on the Bible in, in my view. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, maybe you could start off with getting into some of your research then. So I know you had some slides you wanted to show if you want to pull those up. Yeah, let me pull them up here there should be um, a share screen button on the bottom of your screen yes 
I'm going to get that up. And people feel free to leave questions for Peter in the chat and I'll get to them later. Hey, one question I had about your username, is that supposed to be a pun with the Byzantine uh, dynasty? My username? Yeah, the Paleo Logos. Oh no, but I actually did I did look that up later and I saw that there was kind of that whole connection to that. Yeah. No, I, I had no idea about that one. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's it's more of kind of a play on the um on the bio logos people and oh interesting. That's a good reclaiming one. Reclaiming yeah. the idea of the divine uh word or logos. Um let's see. This turned out to be a little too large of a file size here a moment. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to take a couple of things out of it here and hopefully I'll be able to share it here. Um, let's see. Sorry about that. There we go. Here we go. There's... Um... Ah, it's larger than 50 megabytes. Oh, is it not going to load? <laughs> it's not going to load. Okay, okay. yeah. That's okay. Um, I'll just talk about things. Yeah. Yeah. And I can um, link the paper that you did with Todd Wood as well below. And also, if people do want to see the slides, um, quite a lot of this has been covered on Peter's channel if you go to his channel. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So maybe kind of I'll, I'll begin by kind of talking a little bit about like the biblical basis that we have and then kind of branch out to kind of our models and our theories, um, what kind of what we're hypothesizing and right our basis comes from the book of genesis um obviously kind of and also throughout the bible right adam and eve are referred to as historical people i think we can both agree yeah and in, in genesis 2 verse 7 it is the verse where it talks about the creation of humans it says then the lord god formed man of the dust out of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature now, unfortunately, you know, from the book of Genesis, we don't get a whole lot of details about what man actually looked like in the beginning. Um, but there might be a couple a couple clues. Um, one is that following kind of the fall and everything, Genesis 3 verse 16 says that unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And that's kind of an interesting verse there because it indicates some type of change. And what is that change? Right? We don't really know. But um, some people think that pain became available or happened first following the fall. But I'm more of the view that pain probably pre-existed the fall um, because pain is, is very necessary in our day-to-day -day lives. It kind of warns us when we're about to do something that is, is dangerous. Do you think it could be maybe our relationship with pain? So I know, for example, um, in commenting on the thorns and thistles part of the curse in Genesis, Thomas Aquinas brings up the question, well, did God create something new? And he says, well, no, there was a six-day period where God created everything new. So it's not that thorns and thistles didn't exist before, but man's relationship with them changed. And so at this point, now they become an obstacle to man's work in the field rather than becoming something that works with him. Hmm. Because I know like among young earth creationists, another view is that, you know, lots of creatures, uh, either that God miraculously changed, you know, the structure of creatures following the fall or, the, you know, they had programmed into them in their genes the ability to, you know, change, you know, to the new conditions yeah. following the fall. Yeah. So it, it's possible, you know, that that indicates that God somehow changed human biology following the fall, possibly. Uh, mm -hmm. in be, possibly the pelvic structure so that yeah eve was going to have pain when she gave birth following the fall as she might not have had to such a great extent or perhaps at all before the fall mm -hmm. 
Another verse which I find interesting is Genesis 2, verse 16. It says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. So, you know, we, we know that before the fall, all the creatures were vegetarians, right? And mm -hmm. so that is also a big difference because we can yeah. tell from the teeth of creatures, their digestive systems, what they can eat. And humans must have changed quite a bit then to go from being a vegetarian to an omnivore. And, you know, possibly humans may have even been suited to, you know, collecting fruit in, in some way. Uh, so that might have, you know, affected that as well. Um, so barroom analogy, for those who don't know, is, is the study of what is called the created kind. And the idea of the created kind is that you have this group of organisms that was created at creation that can all interbreed and basically... Um, on the ark when Noah brought two of every clean kind or sorry, two of every unclean kind and um, seven pairs of every clean kind. Um, then he, he represented those original created kinds. And after then all the create, all the creatures that were brought on the ark diversified into these groups that we would call basically uh, the whole Brahmin basically just means the created kind. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of the kind of idea of the created kind comes from Genesis 2, verse 19, where it says that God formed every beast of the field and the fowl of the air, and he brings them to Adam, and he gives Adam the opportunity to name them. And naming them for Adam is kind of an exercise of dominion, I think, right? Mm -hmm. But also what it tells us is that these creatures were distinct enough from one another that Adam on site could recognize these distinctions and he didn't have to take out a microscope and go examine them or look at their bone structure to tell between these different types. It was apparent to him what these different kinds were when he named them. And so from that, barmanologists have gotten the idea that these kinds are created distinct enough from each other that we can tell the difference uh, by looking at their morphology. Because some creationists in the past have thought that, you know, there's this perfect gradient uh, you know, every single possible creature has been existent at some time. And so there's just this perfect gradient, even though nothing is actually related to each other. But, you know, modern creationism would more think that there are uh, gaps between these different types because we they each started from this ancestral population that was different from one another. And... Um, Creationists now have generally thought that, you know, Adam and Eve looked basically exactly like us. And I think part of that actually can tie back to like species fixity. So species fixity, I don't think was ever actually um, necessarily the mainstream view among creationists. But I think there was certainly a time around the time of Darwin and Linnaeus that species fixity grew to be very popular. And even Linnaeus, I think for part of his career, believed in species fixity. And what that basically is, is that God created every single type of creature exactly how it, you know, was in its present form. And we've changed from that quite a bit, right? Now, most creationists would accept that um, the creatures on the ark probably did not look exactly like the ones we have today. And there's been a lot of, you know, speciation since then. Uh, for example, in horses, some of the earliest horses we have are like the size of like a little dog. And, and, and possibly the horses that Noah brought in the ark were that size. And since then, they diversified into all these different types, many of which went extinct. But for some reason, creationists never really wanted to apply that same logic to humans. So we'll talk about like the horse kind, uh, where we have this ancestral population on the ark, which gives rise to a bunch of species. But when we get to humans, we never really want to refer to the, it the same way. And I think when we look at the fossil record, that kind of challenges our view then, right, that humans were, have always been the same. Because when we get to the fossil record, there's all sorts of humans that look quite a bit distinct from us. Maybe I'll show some here. This is, for example, a Neanderthal. Uh, very cool guy. He has this big brow ridge here. He has a giant nose, a brain that's bigger than ours, yeah. uh, some unique teeth and 
all these sorts of features which make him distinct enough from us to be his own species. What do we mean there when we're calling them a distinct species, right? Because I know the traditional definition of species, right, is that they couldn't um, have children with each other, or at least... Um, fertile offspring. Yeah, fertile offspring. Thank you for remembering the word. And it seems that Neanderthals and humans did, right? Because we found it from uh, genetics. So when we're using species here, is the meaning of species changed to simply mean two clearly distinct groups? Or what do we mean by that? Yeah, so that, that's a place where there's still a lot of kind of uh, debate about that. Now, um, in regards to Neanderthals, there is perhaps some evidence that Neanderthals, when they hybridized with modern humans, would have possibly given um, the hybrids, uh, po possibly that union of those genetic sequences would have meant that the hybrids were not as healthy. Um, there's, there's some indication possibly. Um, but yeah, the idea of species. Well, you're referring to the biological species concept, which yeah. is the idea two creatures are of the same species if they can mate and produce fertile offspring. Now, that is very much at odds with kind of how species have been named because, for example, among plants, plants can hybridize like crazy. I mean, like every, there's just so much hybridization among plants that you'd classify just huge groups of organisms that are just very different from each other as being different species. And it also doesn't apply to like asexual organisms that like just split themselves in half and become a new individual, right? How do you classify those as species? Um, and the same thing happens when you're talking about um, also mammals just as well, because you have like um, polar bears and grizzly bears can produce fertile offspring together. I believe rarely it can be the same case with uh, tigers and lions, and they produce something called a ligon or a tigon, uh, depending on whether it's a male or a female. Um, but that would be the biological species concept. But it's not very helpful when we go to the fossil record, usually. There's an exception, certainly in the case of Neanderthals, because we have their DNA. But for most of the fossil record that we're talking about, um, you know, we don't have any genetic uh, evidence. So it, it's hard to, you know, apply that then. So that's why I tend to use what is called the morphological species concept, which is basically mm -hmm. that you can have a certain degree of variation within a species. And once get, something gets too different, you, you name a, a new species. So it's, it's more based on morphological features than, than on hybridization. So that makes exactly sense. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Now, a lot of creationists would argue that speciation can't occur in humans. Um, they argue that because they would they would say that humans, you know, came from Adam and Eve, whereas other creatures might have had, you know, populations of hundreds, right, when they were created in the beginning. Because, you know, God didn't create, for example, just two honeybees in the beginning or whatever type of, you know, insect kind there is there He, because those are communal creatures. So he probably created, you know, tons of them around the world or anything basically other than humans it seems that he created whole groups of them so thus because you have a whole bunch of creatures being created you have more diversity in the genes and thus basically you can have uh, more diverse offspring whereas in the case of humans we all come from two ancestors and that kind of limits somewhat the amount of diversity but i don't think that necessarily means that humans can't um speciate but, but some creationists would certainly be against that. Mm -hmm. But whether you whether you accept different species of humans or not, I mean, the basic facts remain the same, that there are certain types of humans that are very distinctive and different from what we have today. I mean, like a lot of the time, I've, I'm sure you've heard like the statement, like if a Neanderthal were walking down the street and dressed up, you know, you wouldn't even recognize him as, as mm -hmm. being any different. And... That, that possibly could be the case, but for a lot of these things, you would know. I yeah. mean, they're, they're that different. They're, they're four feet tall. They have uh, a differently shaped head, um, differently shaped. Yeah. Um, so, th yeah, did, humans were a lot more diverse. Did you want to get into what else is classified there? So I can, 
I think what most creationists who've spent any time researching this know is it's pretty well agreed that Neanderthal, Erectus, and Denisovan are all um, humans. Mm -hmm. But I think we're, you start getting a little controversial to something like Naledi, but I think most people agree um, that Naledi is human. I think especially now once there's been good evidence of the culture of Naledi, but you get to something like, I think it's, I always confuse Homo heidelbergensis and Habilis. Which one's the older one? Habilis is the older one. This yeah. is the most so I th famous I think when, guy here. I think it's once you get to Habilis and Sediba, that's where it starts getting really controversial. So maybe you wanted to get into those a little bit. Yeah. And, and these ones, like Habilis here, are the ones that we have a lot less physical evidence from. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the... I, we've very fragmentary skeletons. Yeah. I was recently reviewing a Catholic creationist documentary called um, Foundations Restored, and their episodes on human evolution in the series. They claim that Habilis is actually a mix of human and ape fossils, that because the, the fossils were gotten from two different levels, uh, rock levels, um, stratigraphically, and that these were then combined and assumed to be from the same species. Mm -hmm. Is that actually the case? I know you've responded quite a bit about these claims about Sediba, but if you wanted to get into that with... Yeah. Now, okay, so when we're thinking about this, we have like this very distinctive human morphology, right, that we could think about. And then we have like that of the chimpanzee and, and some of those features that would set the human apart from the chimpanzee, like the brow ridge, uh, basically the general shape of the skull is much different. And there are these creatures that appear to be... Um, somewhat of a mosaic form i would say they have features mm -hmm. that they share with humans and ones that they also share with uh, extent apes such as chimpanzees and so yeah when you get to that a favorite creationist argument is basically to call everything that looks transitional a chimeric taxon and that means that you're you're taking bones from multiple different creatures and putting them together and claiming it's a single thing and yeah, unfortunately, the argument is used not only for Habilis, Sediba, Rudolfensis, Naledi. Um, yeah, basically, they like to use it for like everything that looks anywhere mosaic at all. And it's just not a good argument to try to just explain everything with one simple explanation. Now, I'm, I don't think that every single fossil that has ever been attributed to, you know, the the species Homo habilis necessarily is a Homo habilis, but the question is, um, you know, which ones are, are not because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, basically generally their arguments about things, not, not fitting together, uh, because they come, you know, from different levels usually are not correct in my view. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, in, in the case of Naledi, I mean, it's very hard to argue because um, you have basically this chamber in the back in this cave where you have all these bones and the bones, went, went, for example, if you had different creatures that were in there, you'd expect that you'd find two bones of the upper arm and one would look one way and one would look the other way. So you could kind of tell that there's these two different morphologies there. But no, the, the morphology is consistent. Right. And so that's one way that we kind of can tell that there's only one type of creature being represented here. Um, but in the case of Homo habilis, um, many of the important finds related to Homo habilis have not been found articulated or like even like buried actually in the soil. They have been found like just on the top uh, of the surface, just kind of laying there, which doesn't inspire so much confidence but there is certainly close like association of the remains and really we do know that homo habilis is a real taxon simply just just simply from the skull um because we do have a number of good skulls from that taxa taxon um that are distinctive enough so you know whether or not every single fossil is associated to that category is actually homo habilis uh, we do know that there is some type of general Homo habilis form. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so these creatures would have looked, these humans would have looked significantly different from us, you're saying, right? They would have been significantly shorter. What other ways would they have looked ape-like? Yeah, 
Well, first of all, to kind of challenge the term ape-like, mm -hmm. what does it really mean to be an ape? According to kind of the rules of taxonomy, you know, this is a group and it's defined by certain physical traits. And basically, according to kind of taxonomy as it is today, humans are apes. Yeah. Which kind of stems back to how Carl Linnaeus was, was doing things. He put humans and apes together in a group, or humans and extent apes together in this group, basically what we would call apes today. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. So it, I have to be very particular or people yeah. are going to pounce on me from either side. Um, but yeah. the point being that humans are technically apes, but we have some features that are these transitional th what appear to be transitional things have some features which they share with both modern humans and uh, non-human apes. Yeah, and Linnaeus himself, if I'm correct, was a creationist, right? Correct. He, so it's not like these ideas are coming about because of evolutionary ideas and the idea that things fall neatly within a nested hierarchy. I mean, this is an old, this is Aristotle's categories going back here. This is not um, mm -hmm. some modern concept that we're bringing in and interpreting them through evolution. No, things tend to exist within nature in nested hierarchies. And so you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how would they have looked different from us? So basically every single human species besides our own has significant brow ridges. So basically these large bumps of bone over each of your eyes, they would have all had a, a lower face that would have stuck out longer than ours. Um, there's indications from the skull uh, that they would have had a most of most of them would have had a smaller brain case than ours. Neanderthals being an exception. One thing I, I hear a lot is, well, that makes them dumb, doesn't it? But no, there's actually not really a correlation between brain size and intelligence, uh, as has kind of been kind of popularly believed. Those aren't directly correlated, actually. Um, but humans, yeah, basically they would have had some of those features. They also would have been generally shorter. Neanderthals were shorter. Homo erectus was kind of pretty close to our size. Um, but there are some things like Homo habilis, Australopithecus sediba, and some others which would have been around four or five feet tall on average. And, and so they would have been a lot shorter. And mm -hmm. then they also have some interesting features um, of the upper rib cage. One is that uh, they have a rib cage, which is shaped kind of like a triangle. Ours is kind of, we describe it as like a barrel shape because it's kind of broad at the top as it is at the bottom, but they would have had a rib cage that would have shaped a little more like this. And their arm sockets would have actually been able to like move around better, uh, more mobile than ours. And they also had like curved finger bones and things like that, which is all interesting. And particularly because those specific characters are ones that we see in creatures that climb trees today. So that becomes the question. So why were these humans having these features, which today we only see in, in tree dwellers, arboreal creatures? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I don't think we have necessarily a good explanation for that. One possibility is that because Adam and Eve were created to eat fruit, perhaps they would have been uh, better suited to climb a tree and to pick the fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, people are probably going to get upset with me for saying <laughs> that. Um, but I'm not saying they're non-human. I'm just saying they are humans that are adapted to a little bit of a different environment. Yeah. Generally, all these different forms we see, there's some environment that they went into, these people went into following Babel that caused them to get these unique features. For example, Neanderthals, they are very short and stocky. And you look at the long bones of their body and they're like shorter than ours always. And that is something that is connected to this phenomenon called Allen and Bergman's rules, which are these rules that determine like body size and proportions. And basically, creatures that live in northern latitudes generally tend to have, um, or sorry, uh, colder climates tend to be shorter and stockier to conserve heat. And then ones that are uh, in hot environments tend to have longer limbs, right? So they can shed heat better because they have, you know, more uh, body area. So you have more area for your blood to flow through, and thus you can get rid of your heat faster when you're in a hot environment so you don't overheat. And Neanderthals appear to have adapted to their cold climate. And 
you know, we don't know exactly what sorts of uh, climates these other creatures were adapting to, but it's likely that many of them, you know, coming off of the Ark from Babel, were finding these environments following the flood and were adapting to those environments to suit them. Yeah. Yeah, so I know one thing that creationists frequently get accused of here is that we're actually believing in a hyper-evolution. You know, we just believe in evolution way faster. But at least Todd Wood's hypothesis of this, as I understand it, is that the animals were built with a sort of inbuilt capability to be able to adapt to different environments. And he suggests possibly epigenetics. You see, genetics pieces, I understand, rearranging each other themselves as the mechanism for this. I wonder if you could get into that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that could certainly play a role. Um, that That is certainly part of it. And basically, we call it created heterozygosity, which is basically that there's there's these created features that are built into your genome so that when you come to a specific environment, you can adapt to it. Some of the features that we see are probably no doubt also the, the result of mutations. Um, but mutations that were beneficial to those organisms and allowed them to kind of adapt to their environment. Kind of a, uh, connected to this um, is this kind of idea of micro versus macro evolution that you often hear creationists talk about, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, we believe in micro evolution, they believe in macro evolution, right? But that's not actually the case. Micro evolution, as it's defined, actually talks is talking about variation that happens within a species so like um the various different types of body forms that are happening today would be a result of microevolution because we are all part of one species homo sapiens mm -hmm. and when a new species is generated that is macroevolution mm -hmm. right so creationists actually do believe in macroevolution the origin of new species um so there's a little bit of a kind of a misnomer of that term, I think, that's going on. Um, but yes, we think that there is some sort of kind of boundary to how things can diversify. Or, or maybe there's not. Maybe creatures are just created so different from each other that they don't converge into one another despite, you know, diversifying. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you're all that interested in philosophy at all, but perhaps we could say that we believe in accidental evolution, but not substantial evolution, that something doesn't become something else, but we do believe pretty much everything about what it is could change, right? So it could change its looks, its different abilities and stuff, but we don't believe fundamentally what it is, that it changes from one thing into another thing, like that it wouldn't change from like an ape into a person, if that makes sense. Sure, that it, it kind of remains it, its basic nature. Possibly that there are some kind of features that are fundamental to it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you think that's the case or? Possibly. It, it's mm -hmm. possible. I mean, there's kind of two views. One is that there is an actual boundary to how much a creature can diversify. Another idea is that if you're thinking kind of about character space, Mm -hmm. um, which I'll get into a little more later when we're talking about statistics. It's basically just the idea that there is a space in which species can exist. And if you have things related, um, or sorry, if you have creatures created, they are going to diversify out. But if they're created far enough apart from each other, and because convergent evolution is rare, that is uh, uh, getting a trait of another type uh, just through random mutations, um, because that is rare, these two groups won't converge with one another and mix together, even though they are, um, you know, there is no boundary. So those are kind of two possibilities where we could go with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to talk about the statistics a little bit? Because we've sort of referred to all of these things as human, and if, I'll put in the description afterwards, um, Dr. Wood in your paper on this, um, that goes into and explains some of the uh, statistics in more detail. But if you maybe want to give a brief overview, why are we assuming that these are humans? Yeah, I just got, uh, I think, a presentation up there. Do you want to share that? I think, well, is it still I don't see it, it here. Um, okay. Um, basically, um, oh. yeah, I think it's sorry, uploading now. We'll see. 
Okay. All right. Um. See, I don't see it. It looks there. like it's still uploading. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you want to yeah. go in and okay. explain it overall, yeah. Yeah. So basically, the idea is right. If we can tell between what is human and what is non-human, then we can use statistics to look at these different groups and tell what creatures are human and what are not. So one thing that kind of this came up with is this creature right here. This is Australopithecus sediba here, the one that caused a lot of controversy among creationists. And basically they found this and we didn't know what it was. Should it be called Homo sediba? indicating that it's a human? Should it be called Australopithecus sediba? And even kind of in the conventional scientific community, they weren't exactly sure initially. The man who discovered it, Dr. Lee Berger, initially wanted to call it Homo sediba, but he kind of ended up uh, facing some pressure over that and did end up calling it Australopithecus sediba, indicating it is not a human. Now, the idea basically is that we have these two groups and when we look at them, now we can basically tell uh, basically what a creature is, whether it is human or not, based on these certain characteristics uh, that they have there. So if we just find a random skull of a creature, we can use it, measure it in all these different ways, do statistical analysis, and then find out whether it is human or not. And also the idea is to find out Okay, so we have humans, and then we have these extent apes like chimpanzees. And these creatures, like the Australopithecines, are believed to be intermediate between, you know, chimpanzees, well, between the last common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans. Um, they're believed to be somewhat intermediate, right? So these... Uh, Here we there go. We go. Yeah. Um, there we go. Yeah, so... This is a chart here from that paper that you mentioned uh, that got published last fall. So basically what this is along the left side of the paper here, uh, we've got these different scientific names here, beginning with Paranthropus boisei, uh, going all the way down to Australopithecus sediba. And then on the top, we've got all these different names of all these different statistical methods. So each of these vertical columns um, with that are colored, the green, the light blue, and the dark blue, each of those vertical columns is one statistical analysis. And the number in each of those boxes is telling you, when we did the statistical analysis, what group that creature ended up inside of. So you'll see in this analysis, uh, the very first one on the left, these three species of paranthropus all grouped together in one group. And then these species of Australopithecus and chimpanzees, that's pan troglodytes there, they all group together in one group. And then you'll notice Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, some others, and then Homo habilis and Sediba all grouped together. In every single test that we did using this character matrix, they, they ended up in one group being the human. Um, so each of those um, each of those vertical columns represents a graph like this one that you're seeing here. And you can see here these kind of these three distinct groups, right? You've got that red group off to the left, you've got that green group kind of down at the bottom, and then that blue group way up far on the right. And basically what we're looking at here is that character space and we're seeing how these different species, uh, are in relation to one another. Now, this graph that you're looking at here is a representation of a graph that should actually be looked at in like nine dimensions, <laughs> which <laughs> is very hard to do, right? It's, it's hard to visualize nine dimensions. There are some very technical ways you can do it, but the best we can do it is in three dimensions, which I'll show you in a minute here. Um, so, so based, are, yeah. are we Sorry, collapsing then multiple dimensions into a singular dimension? Like four of the dimensions are one way and five of them are the other way? Or are we just picking two important dimensions and looking at those? So basically the idea is, for example, imagine you have three dimensions and you're looking at them and there's three different groups here. One is here, one is here, and one is here. Um, basically what we're doing is we're looking at this thing from the side so that we can see these three groups best. 
Mm -hmm. um, but in, yeah. Um, so what you'll find here is that um, once again, these things all fell into those groups there. We have the Paranthropus genus, Australopithecines with chimpanzees, and then that human group there. And what's important here is that in every single analysis, you can see Sediba falls with the humans, which is what sparked a whole controversy and a lot of different papers between creationists writing back and forth to each other. Um, here is what we tried to do. So basically, with the statistical programs that we use, we can manually force something to be into the cluster that it is not in. So you can see here, we forced Australopithecus sediba on the left into that, that green cluster. And what you see there is that that line, rather than going forward, actually goes backwards. And what that tells us is that it does not correlate good with that group. And then you can see here on the right, uh, we also did that trying to put it with the genus Pranthropus. And once again, it did not work good. So basically what that tells us is that this skull that we are looking at here is indeed a human. It does not fit with these other things. It is clearly a human based on these characters. This is another character set uh, with more characters and more taxa here. And what you can see once again is kind of the separation of these groups. Up here we've got at the very top what is in blue, non-humans, and then we've got humans in green, and then we have Homo floresiensis which just doesn't like to cluster with anything. <laughs> it, it seems that we probably don't have enough data on it because we only have a single skull and uh, that's probably why it's not working. It's not clustering with anything, but it is probably humid because it was found with stone tools in a cave and yeah, it probably is. But uh, here's another view of that as you can see here. And here's this. And you can see, once again, we tried to stick Sediba into this other group and then Naledi into this other group, and it just does not work to put either of those in that other group. And that is why Dr. Wood and I are both arguing that Australopithecus Sediba is a human and, you know, not a part of this non-human group here. Let's see. Here we go. So this is a visual representation of um, that... Uh, basically a view of it in three dimensions here where you can see kind of those three different groups there. Um, the big group on the top is the human group. And then the one on the right is the genus Paranthropus. And then on the left, the genus Australopithecus. And what's important here is you can see there are these gaps in between the groups, right? Now, that's somewhat of an issue because they believe that these groups are all very closely related, right? And they think that uh, that group on the left with those two taxa there is ancestral to humans. And yet you can see there's a gap there, quite a large one. And so this is where we come up with the idea of there's being these different groups and that all these humans are morphologically distinct uh, from these other creatures, these non-humans. And... Um, people have said, well, you know, we, the fossil record isn't very complete, right? We're missing some, some creatures. We're missing some species. But you can see we'd need a lot of species really to, to kind of fill in this gap here uh, between humans and non-humans. So basically the idea of statistical varminology is to look at these creatures and tell whether we can see these original created kinds and figure out what all the members are. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that for humans. Uh, we can, we know basically pretty well kind of the boundaries of the human kind. Um, we don't have that very well for non-human apes because we simply haven't done a lot on them yet. So like we don't know yet whether chimpanzees are related to like Lucy, for example, um, or not. That's still something that we have to figure out or even like whether chimpanzees and gorillas are related to one another so that's an area where we have to do a lot of work yet. But so far, most of these analyses, really the best quality ones, have only been done on um, craniodental data. So that is basically stuff of your skull and of your teeth. And that's somewhat unfortunate because, right, mm -hmm. we need creatures on more than just their head. Um, so <laughs> that is very important. Kind of the next big stage for hominid barominology is to go into the postcranial area and 
figure out whether based on, you know, postcranial we material, we can still tell these humans and these non-humans apart from one another. Yeah. So I know one critique that there's been of um, your paper, and it was Erica Gutsit Gibbon did a critique where she said she looked at the other list of um, created kinds w Dr. Mm -hmm. Wood had put out, and it was all at the family level pretty much. But here we have it at the level of genera. So if we took another created kind that's at the family level, something like uh, Feely Day or something like that, are we going to find, and then we put, we plot it. Is it going to look like what you just showed us? Or is it going to look like it's all over the place, just like one of those groups that in the human kind, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that if you would look at one of those groups, you would see there isn't a whole lot of discontinuity between any of the members. And it's very hard to try to break things up into groups within one of those one of those things. Now, recently, there was a paper that came out in the Creation Research Society quarterly, and I haven't really had a, a chance to kind of go through it completely and everything, but they took the example of domestic dogs. And what they did is they took all these dogs together and looked at them, and they were arguing that, you know, you could tell that there was discontinuity between groups, but it was very, very slight, and um, there was like no out group to compare it with and and so mm -hmm. there were some issues with that but um yeah that is interesting that oftentimes especially among you know mammals it does seem to be at the family level now there are some kind of there are quite a few exceptions one of those issues is actually insects where uh there is work being done on those and it doesn't seem that uh it is at the family level that you can find an insect well, created well kind what would you find there? I'm not exactly sure. Okay, yeah. Somebody in the chat says Lucy is a fraud. Um, well, you know, there's been a lot of debate about that. Uh, what I could recommend you to is you should check out my channel, Paleo Logos, and I have some videos about Lucy, and um, you should check those out and kind of figure figure out um, because there's a lot of kind of creationist ideas about Lucy that are not true, unfortunately. Yeah. Like there's this kind of whole idea that got started partially by Dr. David Menton of the creation museum um, that evolutionists basically took her pelvis and cut it to pieces to make it look like they wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And that's just completely not true. They actually, I mean, the way that he represented this, kind of misinformed people and yeah basically what actually happened there was that he made a plaster cast of the original pelvis and then took apart these bones that had been fused together wrong during fossilization and put them out in their original order and i have a whole video kind of explaining that and why that's a very legitimate thing to do um but yeah that's that's another point that a lot of creationists get very heated about is the australopithecines and whether they were bipedal or not and um, basically my point is that um, they probably were bipedal but that doesn't make them our ancestors yeah yeah i mean lots of animals are bipedal and kangaroos are bipedal but we're not going around debating whether or not kangaroos are the ancestors of humans right um i mean that that to me kind of makes it not really a big a, a big deal because I, I really don't get why other creationists are, are so obsessed with saying that, you know, these things were not bipedal because we have all sorts of creatures that can walk upright, like gibbons, for example. Mm -hmm. um, when they get on the ground, they like to walk around on their hind legs. There's lemurs uh, called Sifaka's lemurs, and they like to jump along their hind legs along the ground. So there's primates that, um, you know, do that. Yeah even so yeah for me it isn't really a big concern that the australopithecines were bipedal but for some people that they think is a very big deal yeah um one second um yeah one thing i wanted to get into here which i thought would be good is the chronology of this because i think some of this research is very interesting um 
And where I mostly focus on is theology. And I think an area where this can really inform theology is on our interpretation of the book of Genesis. Because, and I don't just mean Genesis 1 through 11, but it also sets up the context of the Abraham mm -hmm. narrative. Because Abraham is coming out of a time yeah. where very close to the Tower of Babel. You know, it depends on... Job as well. Yeah. So if we're looking at... Um, they know the, the timing of Job is very controversial. So we get into that in a it second, is. maybe. <laughs> but um, for Abraham, right, if the Tower of Babel is either about um, 2200 BC on the Masoretic timeline, about 2800 BC on the Septuagint uh, timeline, I don't know if you have a favorite of those two. Um, but going from there, it seems that Abraham is probably only about 200 to 400 years after the Tower of Babel, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. So what are we then to make of the Abraham narrative? You know, were these animals still alive when Abraham was walking the earth? Yeah. And and maybe one of the bigger questions there is whether all these different types of humans were alive when he yeah. was there, right? Because this is where we kind of get to the whole issue about the connection of paleoanthropology to archaeology right yeah. and that becomes very kind of controversial among creationists and there's kind of going back to the tower of babel there's two different kind of views some creationists believe that the vast majority of uh, people went to the tower of babel others believe that there was a kind of major dispersal before the tower of babel yeah and yeah, i think that's um douglas petrovich's view which was put forward in the is genesis history documentary right exactly it's, it seems to me there was already significant violence between humans long before um the tower that he points out at eridu was built that we can just see by layers there was already multiple cities of eridu before that time and so that to me mm -hmm. seems like a major issue with that theory to me as well and and you know from that, he has to claim that these other humans that had left had already developed quite a lot of infrastructure all over before the other humans who went to Babel mm -hmm. were spreading out. And, you know, it becomes somewhat of a challenge, you know, to unite those two because based on, you know, radiometric dating, you know, even relatively, it, it, it's, it's hard to exactly, you know, align these two from a creationist, a young earth creationist perspective. Um, so how exactly do we get from this population at, at, at Babel to, to Abraham's time? So my understanding is that at the time of Babel, we probably have a, a population of humans that looks something like Homo erectus or possibly Homo georgicus. Um, let's see. Here we go. This is this is Homo erectus right here. So this may possibly have been what people looked like around the time of Noah and his family, possibly. And after that, it appears that there was a very large dispersal that Homo erectus in species besides our own that ended up on all three old world continents, Asia, Europe, and uh, Africa. And there are a couple uh, things like Homo habilis that predate, it, it seems, Homo erectus in Africa. And it's possible that those are some very, very early people who went down all the way down to the bottom of Africa before Homo erectus was spreading. Could it possibly be that some of these earliest groups are humans that did not go to Babel, that we could perhaps accept that there's some small groups who spread out even if the majority of humans were at Babel? Or do you think I we think have so. to accept that they were all? No, I, I think it's probably it's probably true that not everybody went to Babel, mm -hmm. most likely. But then what I find interesting is that very, very soon we have Homo erectus showing up in Europe, Asia, and Africa very soon. So like around the 2 million year mark, if I'm correct, we have Homo erectus in both Africa and Asia which is interesting, I think, that we have what seems to be a very sudden dispersal of Homo erectus across kind of the old world continents, and which is part of why I think that uh, this population going out from Babel was Homo erectus or something similar to that, because this is kind of 
possibly these very first people going out there. And then once these people end up in these different environments, we have um, some cases of dwarfism, like in the case of Homo floresiensis, where we have um, these humans get stranded on these islands. And it appears that uh, because they have a limited food supply over time, the population be gets, uh, becomes smaller and only three feet tall. Uh, yeah, when I referred to two million years, I was saying in radiometric dating, not necessarily in my time frame, but I'm saying radiometrically dated conventional science would place them at that mark there. Yeah, so just sent you a useful term for us to refer to these layers. And when we're right now trying to discuss where they actually should be dated to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So around this time, there appears to have been basically a mass speciation event, which is that we have all these different species arising very soon after one another. And this isn't just the case for humans. It's the case for a lot of different creatures that we see ar around this time post flood, you know, a lot of speciation happening very rapidly in, in these created kinds. Um, so as I kind of mentioned before, we have all these different kind of, um, you know, so uh, environmental factors that play into this speciation. And, you know, we do have from uh, areas in the Middle East, some very early like depictions of humans. And they do seem to be portraying modern Homo sapiens uh, because uh, you know, there's an argument to be made, you know, people just basically draw themselves how they want to be seen. But it does seem that when we see these people living in cities, producing art and stuff, they do seem to be, uh, you know, anatomically, basically identical to us. And so it appears that these other human species were, uh, were not, uh, were very early settlers before people were building cities and, um, things like that. And so that is kind of how that connects. So then to the time of Abraham, um, Abraham certainly was a homo sapiens. I mean, it, it only makes sense kind of because of what we know about, um, you know, uh, genetics. Um, and it, it seems that our own species, homo sapiens, possibly arose somewhere in North Africa, possibly. Um, and and began to spread out and kind of enter into these other areas and either kind of get rid of these other humans or you know accept them into their group and basically assimilate them into their own population yeah how does this fit in with the sons of noah i don't know if you got a chance to look at it but i'd sent you a paper on an old earth creationist attempt to map in the sons of noah that i found very interesting where they essentially used genetic data and mapped onto certain groups, the Bible for looking at male haplogroups. Um, and they were finding certain groups that mapped onto the biblical groups. And they tended to find, well, the sons of Shem seem to be J, the sons of uh, Japheth seem to be R, and the sons of Ham seem to be E. And then they walked back genetically and said, okay, what's close, most closely related to these groups? And assumed those are from those other sons of Noah. But it seems to me that doesn't account for something like Neanderthals, who I think we've sequenced mm -hmm. their DNA and found it is actually distinct from all three groups. So how do Homo sapiens fit in? Are they just from one son of Noah and that we're all from that? Or are they from all three? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't really have so much of a chance to look at the paper you sent me today. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about that. Um, but generally, yeah, I am kind of skeptical of the idea that we can genetically, you know, figure out these the, the genetic types of the three sons of Noah. And there's been attempts at that, you know, using the Y chromosome by young earth creationists as well, you know, to identify those three groups. And as you mentioned, the reason why I'm skeptical of that is because of these other human groups, right? that we do not have DNA for some of them. Others we do have like Neanderthals, as you mentioned, and Denisovans. Um, but yeah, but when we look simply at modern humans, what we're finding is not the three sons of Noah. I don't think it's, it's some common ancestors of um, Homo sapiens. So our own species. So then that leads to the question, as you mentioned, you know, are these descendants of a specific son 
Um, I don't think we're prepared to answer that. Um, yeah, that's that's all I have that's to say. Fair, I, yeah. I think for some of these things, we could probably answer that. For example, Neanderthals are probably um, descendants of uh, Japheth, who uh, went, uh, it appears, to a more northerly European area, um, for example. But yeah, I, I don't think we're prepared to exactly, you know, find genetic evidence of each of these sons of Noah without actually having more DNA from a variety of human species. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think um, that there's also the possibility of multiple origin points for Homo sapiens, that Definitely. Homo erectus in multiple areas became Homo sapiens? And this was perhaps an already inbuilt capability that when God created the world, he foreknew essentially that they were going to have to change after Babel to fit into the new environments and that Homo erectus then changed into Homo sapien. Um, okay. Um, hmm. I'm just sort of throwing yeah. it out there because I'm trying I, I, to. I thought about that too before. And, you know, to me that seems somewhat problematic because I don't see a reason why these things would become human or mm -hmm. sorry, become anatomically modern human. Yeah. Uh, why they would just end up getting our traits. I think it's more likely that our own species arose and spread out um, probably a little later than these other species and ended up, for some reason, becoming the dominant species. And, you know, that's definitely something that needs more research because we need to kind of understand that better. And I'm working on a little bit of a project right now about trying to kind of understand, you know, how we can tell, you know, which species have arisen from what and within yeah. the human group yeah that'll be really good because one thing i've noticed there seems to be very little communication between the creation scientists and the creation archaeologists that there seems to be a bit mm -hmm. of a disconnect there where the creation archaeologists talk they're not taking the events of as they've been determined by creation science into account but then I've seen some end on the creation scientists that they don't seem to be all that focused on art. How do we get from the Ark to the Tower of Babel to Genesis 12 is now happening. We have Abraham on the scene and it seems pretty clear that we're in the um, world of that. Make. We're in the modern world as we would recognize it sort of sense. And there also seems to be some issues here on just our chronology of the ancient worlds as well. So especially some of those older Egyptian dynasties, there was quite a bit of debate going. Unfortunately, it seems the new chronology stuff has somewhat been dying out recently. Yeah, um, I, I think you're right that we do kind of have these two kind of views and we're, it's difficult to try to see how they fit together, right? Because we have from this archaeological perspective, right, um, Doug Petrovich, for example, trying mm -hmm. to argue that uh, the late Uruk expansion represents the uh, dispersal from the Tower of Babel. And from kind of a more paleoanthropological view, we have to kind of argue more that uh, this dispersal happened a little differently. Different people went uh, in different areas than what would happen during the Uruk expansion. So that's certainly something that you know, we need more work on as young earth creationists to try to connect those two different sciences and see kind of model building those two. Yeah. Hi, Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah. One thing, um, I'll have to send it to you some other time and get your thoughts on it, but there was an article back from 1986. I'm sure it's very out of date, but it was from, um, AJM Osgood, where he was trying to place Abraham, and he argues for a late copper, early bronze setting for Abraham based on the ge biogeography of Palestine at the time, and noticing that the areas where Sodom and Gomorrah seem to be described. The last time that we have recorded humans there is from secularly dated to about 10,000 BC. And so he's arguing that that's actually the proper setting for Abraham. Um, but then that creates huge, huge issues for even the most radical revisions of Egyptian chronology. And so I don't know how to place that. And part of the issue here is that as we're looking at, right, we're discovering there's many, many different disciplines that all have to work together here. And mm -hmm. some of them have zero qualified creationists in that area. And so... Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's definitely a problem. The the very kind of minimal amount of creation scientists that we have, 
Uh, and also, you know, we, we don't have any creation scientists in the field of paleoanthropology, which is what I hope to go into. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's that's an issue. And also we have a lot of creationists all working on kind of their own separate projects. And really what we need is creationists coming together from different disciplines to work on building creation models. Um, one example of that happening, right, was the catastrophic plate tectonics and kind of how you got the paleoanthropologists or sorry, the paleontologists and the geologists and everybody together. And they made a very interesting model that has some interesting ramifications for creation, if it's true. And there's undoubtedly, you know, some issues with that, like the heat problem and things like that. Um, but I think, yeah, that is important uh, that creationists begin getting together, trying to work from a multidisciplinary approach to do that. Because right now in a kind of creationist world, scientists are kind of loners, right? You, you kind of need to know everything you need to know to work on it. Whereas in secular science, you have a lot of people working more in tandem together. And I think that is, that is definitely an area where there needs to be growth in, in creationism of kind of these joint multidisciplinary kind of studies. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, model building and trying to come up with predictions from a young earth creationist point. And I, yeah, I, I think model building, uh, especially kind of for the human tree, we have some very specific uh, things that the Bible tells us, which are very useful. Uh, the number of people on the ark, um, you know, the number of people at the beginning. We have some very kind of, you know, specific details about how people were spreading and things that can really guide us as we attempt to make a creation model. And that is definitely, you know, a place where more work needs to happen. And, and hopefully as we continue to do that, we can form a more comprehensive idea of how these disciplines fit together. Yeah. yeah perhaps I can go to some of the questions here. Yeah. Um, the question from Spence Dangles, and thank you, Spence, for the super chat. That's any books you recommend reading? Um, so generally, from my perspective, there aren't a ton of very good creationist books on the subject. Um, there are a few classics like Contested Bones by Dr. John Sanford and Christopher Rupi. Uh, I disagree with them on a lot. Um, there are some by like Marvin Lubnow who wrote Bones of Contention. But overall, yeah, I, I'm not particularly pleased with any creationist literature, uh, kind of popular level literature. Yeah. Um, kind of from a more secular view is a book called From Lucy to Language. And it is, um, you know, the conventional view of paleoanthropology, but that is a very good book talking about these different types of humans and non-humans. Yeah. Yeah. But if people can't find stuff to read, you can't get into all the technical stuff. I've read your paper, but I don't understand half of what I'm reading there. But if people yeah. want to look more, um, your channel, I think, is very helpful with walking through this. And also, um, Todd Wood has a blog called Human Genesis that explains some of his discoveries yeah. here. Yeah, so not a lot of books, but there are some online resources. And yeah. I'm hopefully going, I have a website already. Um, it, it's not, I haven't actually uploaded content yet, but I hope to kind of do that and provide some articles for people to read and possibly begin wor working on some type of book on the subject as well. Because, yeah, I think, I think that's an area where we're somewhat lacking once again and uh, definitely could use some more materials for creationists on the topic. Yeah. One person asked about a particular book, After the Flood, by Bill Cooper. Have you read that? I have not read that. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know from my perspective, I work as a teacher. And one of the things I've been wanting to do is trying to create better resources for um, sort of traditional Catholic homeschoolers. Mm -hmm. And quite a lot of them are young earth creationists, and I want to put out better material for them. Um, and I thought about what do I, if people are asking me for stuff, what would I recommend on stuff? One book I do want to recommend to people here. Hold on. I can just grab it from my desk here is, um, fossils in the flood by Paul Garner. This is a beautifully, beautifully illustrated book, um, where he's just talking about essentially the secular, not secular, sorry, the standard 
creation model, sort of the best up-to-date stuff with beautiful illustrations and good explanations for introductory people. And it works well, I think, both with like kids because you have those beautiful illustrations, but even just the text of it is qu uh, quite at an adult reading level there. And so, yeah, and his his book, The New Creationism, also mm -hmm. does a good job of kind of setting forth uh, more recent creationist views because, yeah, I'm generally kind of the creationist community, the kind of public community is is quite a ways away from the actual scientists who are working in the field, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. As I've as I've kind of observed, for example, that that uh, example I brought up earlier of the canopy model, right? There's almost no creation scientist anywhere today who is arguing for the canopy model, and yet that remains very popular, you know, among kind of the lay level creationists. And so, yeah, I think getting these creationists from these different disciplines to work on these materials is very important if we want to actually kind of change. Um, the standard of evidence and kind of better create a, a creation view. And I, I think, yeah, Garner does a very good job of that. I think. Yeah. Books. Yeah. So um, I definitely do work looking at theology. I do some focus on biblical theology, but my main focus really is systematic theology. And so I'm thinking what can, do you think there's any way that theologians can help the creationist scientists do their work? And do you think there's anything creationist scientists can offer theologians in their work? I, I wouldn't consider myself a theologian, just to be clear. I just am interested in the topic, but. Well, I, there, there definitely is. I mean, like, um, yeah, especially for like Hebrew scholars, of course, mm -hmm. who, or, uh, you know, or Greek and, and things like that connected to the original text, um, mm -hmm. right? Understanding um, various details of the creation related to the use of, for example, the word uh, min, for example, and its relation to kind of the idea of the created kinds. That's certainly a place um, about the creation of, of Adam out of uh, what appears to be the red clay. I've, I've heard it interpreted certainly like in the uh, flood, there's, there's certainly, you know, things there in the text about various details of the flood and the chronology of it that are definitely a place where we need, um, you know, Hebraists and others who, who know and can read and interpret kind of that original source material to kind of inform exactly what constraints, you know, the models that we build have. Yeah. Somebody asks, what do you think about Dr. Walt Brown and the hydroplate theory? Um, generally, um, hydroplate theory, I think, is probably the worst flood model of, like, all of them. There's basically uh, not a lot of good evidence for it. Um, in, in my understanding, catastrophic plate tectonics is a lot better than that. There are some issues with it, as I mentioned before. But, yeah, hydroplate theory, there's not very many predictions that that theory could really make uh there's just really a lack of geological evidence for it and um yeah i i don't really think very much of hydroplate theory yeah looking for other questions in the chat i had someone start off the stream by mentioning based in geocentrist pilled so i don't know if you have any <laughs> thoughts on geocentrism oh boy um, <laughs> not, not in particularly Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah I may, think of any, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Shall I kind of talk a little bit about some various creationist books on the topic? Yeah, I think that would be good. Yes, I think a lot of people want to know more about this, you know. But as you were saying earlier, there's a big disconnect between the popular level and the real science, and that's not people accuse blame creationists for this, but it's the same issue in secular academia. And if you look at most high school textbooks on science, I'm sure most of them are a good 20 years out of date with the actual research in that field. Yeah. So this is an example of one creationist book on science, uh, trying to deal with paleoanthropology. This is Buried Alive by Jack Cuozo. He's uh, one of the few creationists who actually had the opportunity to go to other countries and study some of the original uh, fossil material from Neanderthals and uh, also Homo heidelbergensis, I believe. Um, he basically brings up the idea that if people were living for very, very long periods of time, we should be able to tell based on their bones. 
which is certainly an interesting idea, right? That we might be able to detect then if we would find fossils of people that were living for hundreds of years, we might be able to tell that they were. But unfortunately, he's trying to argue that the Neanderthals were those people who were living for hundreds of years. And there's just a lot of issues with his work. This is the most exciting book about paleoanthropology you will ever read. It has like at least like three car chases in it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you're, it so you're saying people don't develop a like really thick brow ridge at, when they get older. That was his claim. <laughs> yeah. So basically he went to France. He, he seems to have either had some very unusual circumstances or written some very odd things about people who are supposedly trying to stop his research and stuff like that. But basically, yeah, his argument was that based on, uh, if you, if you use the computer model to artificially age a human skull, it ended up basically making a brow that was a little more prominent and your chin would lessen a little bit. And so he's like, well, Neanderthals have a big brow and they don't have a very projecting chin. So, right. I mean, Neanderthals are just really, really old people, right? Um, the problem is that we have Neanderthal children. And mm -hmm. if if Neanderthals are just modern humans who are really old, well, then why do their children look different from us, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's also the issue. It, it When you artificially age a modern human skull, it, it really just doesn't look anything like a Neanderthal, just some superficial resemblance of a few features. But mm -hmm. that was basically his whole claim. And it's very, very much the minority position among even young earth creationists who would hold mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. What do you think about the claim that they're just, these were groups that were just a little bit separate from the main human population. These are the results of inbreeding. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, part of that kind of develops from a view of ourselves as being kind of the normal people and everybody mm -hmm. else as being different from us. Right. Um, when, when people wanted to portray Adam and Eve in art, for example, like Michelangelo, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they portray them as white Caucasians. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's like, well, that really tells us more about what you think about yourself more than anything objective at all. Right. Um, yeah. My, my perspective would be more, sorry. Yeah, no, I was looking, I don't think I have it up on the wall here. It must be That's at another shot. spot, <laughs> but I have, um, here we go. I'll go grab it off the wall up there. I see it. All right. <laughs> Looks like I put that one up with um, some sticky stuff rather than just Velcro, so I can't take That's it you. down. But I have an icon of um, different, a few icons that are from Ethiopia. And so, of course, Jesus is black. Mary is black. They all have like short curly hair because that's what everyone has there. So I think it's the tendency that when we have religious art, we tend to portray the person as we're all used to because that's all the people around you are looking at when you're drawing your art. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we have the same issue because everyone alive today is a homo sapiens. Right. And <laughs> so we just automatically assume they must have been homo sapiens. But yeah, I, I don't think the fossil record can really support that view that, you know, homo sapiens was the main group always because based on, you know, radiometric dating being relative, homo mm -hmm. sapiens peters out and towards mm -hmm. like the very the very earliest homo sapiens have a lot of features that start to begin looking more like those of other species for example homo heidelbergensis um they began to look more like that particular taxa mm -hmm. so yeah i i think it it's most likely the other way around that you know some other species is the main species that was ancestral to a whole bunch and eventually you know homo sapiens that would dominate um but the idea that there was inbreeding is is undoubtedly true. Like, for mm -hmm. example, if you read about Abraham's lineage and how he marries and, you know, they marry, it, it's very complicated trying to make a family tree mm -hmm. and then somebody marries the father. Yeah, there, it's very complicated. Yeah. Judah, Judah, I think he, he, he gets a baby with 
his daughter-in-law is it yeah uh, anyway yeah it, it's a mess and there's a lot of inbreeding there and i think that was probably characteristic of you know that time period having a limited population of people and thus a lot of inbreeding happening you know within that group and we do have evidence for that for some like very late neanderthals around the time that neanderthals were going extinct uh, we do have evidence that they were in these inbred populations um so if, if I think that is likely that there was inbreeding, but inbreeding is actually um, something that can, you know, create a new species. So, you know, having inbreeding isn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily mutually exclusive with, you know, speciation because inbreeding, what is called the founder's effect, where you have, you know, a patriarchal figure uh, who, everybody in his lineage carries a lot of his DNA, uh, end up looking a lot like him. Um, so the, all of those things that we would expect, yeah, could, could undoubtedly lead to kind of rapid uh, morphological change, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we wrap up or? Um, I think that is all. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming on, Peter. Yes, thank you. I've really yeah. enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Thanks for everyone who watched. And it was uh, great to talk with you. Yeah. And I'll see everyone soon. So people know for my channel, I will have, I did an interview with Swan Sona on natural law. So part of that will be uploaded soon. Um, the whole thing is available for Patreon subscribers. Uh, but otherwise, I won't be doing anything new until after Easter. But hopefully then I should have some more live streams. So thanks, everyone, for watching. Awesome.